Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Hey, Jen. Hey, Cam. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. Ooh, that was high pitch. Sorry. I'm good. <laughs> How are you? I am great. It's a fantastic, sunny Sunday morning. Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. Just like so many before us. And, you know, uh, <laughs> I hear you have a case Dizzy? here. It's a the doozy. <laughs> There's a word for you. It is, it's a doozy. It is described as Australia's most vicious crime or one of australia's most vicious crimes it's deals i'll just do a content warning again i know people sometimes get upset if i there's one before the show why do you do it again well this one kind of involves with rape sexual assault young kids you know it's not young but teenage girls it can be harmful for those that yeah you know how that goes i do i do so yeah it might get a little graphic too and I apologize, but there is a reason for it, and we'll go into it when we go through it. I'm so, ready. Prepare I'm put my yourself. Seat belt on. You do it. Do that. I it's am. Not, it's horrible. It's not for the weak-minded. All right, let's go. I watched, I watched a documentary on one of the in, on this, and they interviewed one of the girls' brothers, and I like had a lump in my throat the entire time, and my kept going, and in my head I was going, "Don't cry, don't cry, don't cry." Mm. It, it's yeah. That's all. So here we go. Are you ready? Let's do it. There are some names in this episode of Australian towns that I may be pronouncing wrong. I tried my darndest to get it correctly. I even emailed our friend Nicole, who is a listener of the show. She lives down in Australia or over or under, wherever. <laughs> and uh, she helped me with what she could. And some of them she didn't know for sure. So my apologies if I get any of them wrong. I tried really hard. I swear I did. Hey, and so, if you're from there and you know. Let us know. Let for us sure. know. Yeah. And be nice about it because I really did try. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't believe ready? you. Yes, I'm I ready. did. In 1992, in the town of Glenroy, just north of Melbourne, Australia, 13-year-old Prue Bird told her psychiatrist that a car had been following her. She stated that she'd been followed a few times recently, and it had always been the same blue vehicle. And, you know, since they weren't really sure if Prue was telling the truth, if she was imagining things, or maybe she was just being paranoid, not much was really done with this information. Prue's father had died when she was young, and her mother, Jenny, remarried. Prue's stepfather adopted her and gave her Prue's last name. He was the only real father figure that she had ever had, and Prue really liked him. So when Jenny separated from her stepfather a few years later, Prue was quite upset. Things got even more contentious when Jenny began a new relationship with a woman named Isabel. The mother-daughter relationship was so strained that Jenny eventually asked Isabel to move out. The plan was not to end their relationship, but to give Prue some space and to allow Jenny to work on mending the connection with her daughter. In January of 1992, Prue and her friend, who would later be identified only as Witness M, so we're going to call her M, they were hanging out and they were enjoying the day. And all of a sudden there was a knock on the door. Prue answered and standing there was a man that she didn't know. And this man asked, is this Daniel's car? Now, Prue, not knowing who Daniel was, just responded with no. And the man pressed further, asking, are you sure? Prue said yes, she was certain, and she slammed the door in his face. Prue's friend, M, who didn't go to the door, noticed that Prue had gone pale and seemed visibly shaken. All Prue would say was that the man was, quote, really weird. Now, we were left to wonder, is this the man that Prue recognized? I mean, was he the one following her in the car, right? A few hours later, M left to go home, and as she walked down the street, a man drove past her in a blue car. 
honked, and waved. Now, M didn't recognize the man, so she just kept walking. Now, the man turned the car around and began driving alongside her, slowly, keeping pace with her. And although the strange man didn't say anything to M, he never took his eyes off of her. M said that the man gave her this sick feeling, so she took off running to a nearby friend's house. The man in the blue car then drove away, and later when she got home, M called Prue, and the two compared notes on what the man looked like, and they realized that the man who knocked on the door and the man who drove alongside M that afternoon were the exact same person. Ugh. A few days later, on February 2nd, 1992, Jenny Bird left the house early for work, and Prue was still sleeping, so Jenny didn't wake her. When Jenny arrived home around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Prue was still in bed. Now, as we know, February is summer in Australia, and it was a fairly hot day, so Jenny asked Isabel to drive her to a local pool. Isabel agreed and dropped Jenny off, but Isabel couldn't stay and swim because she had friends coming over to help her move things out of Jenny's house. Around 1.45 in the afternoon, Isabel said that Prue finally emerged from her bedroom and said hello to Isabel's friends that had just arrived. Prue emptied a can of creamed corn onto a plate and stuck it in the microwave. She was making herself something to eat. And while Prue was walking back to her room, the phone rang. Isabel answered, and it was for Prue. And Isabel would later say that the caller was a male, but unfortunately, she had not overheard Prue's conversation. About 30 minutes later, Isabel heard the phone ring again. And since she was out back with her friends loading up the trailer, she assumed that Prue had answered the phone. Fifteen minutes after that, Isabel was all finished with her work outside and entered the house from the back, and she had noticed the front door was standing wide open. She also saw that the television was on and the plate of the cream corn was sitting on the coffee table, untouched. But Prue was nowhere to be found. When Prue's mother reported her missing, she was told by the police, what? <laughs> Quote, teenagers go missing all the time. Mm, no, they don't. Prue I mean, Bird maybe, was, but not like, mm -hmm. not like that. No. Prue Bird was never seen again. On the night of September 13th, 1997... Five years after Prue went missing, a 19-year-old girl by the name of Rosa Marie was hanging out at Garima Place in the city of Canberra in New South Wales, which is about seven hours northeast of Melbourne. Known as the city's living room, Garima Place is an outdoor paved courtyard type area with plenty of shops and restaurants, and the city has done a lot to make it an appealing kind of hit place to congregate. But back in the 90s, it was known as the place where all the junkies would hang out. Rosa Marie looked quite a bit younger than her 19 years, but was nevertheless approached by two men in their mid to late 20s. One identified himself as Les, and the other was his mate Kiwi. He asked Rosa Marie if she could inject them with speed because neither he nor his friend Kiwi knew how to do it. Now, I'm sure, I hope... There was conversations prior to, you know, hey, could you shoot me up? But that's all the story that we know. Now, Les told Rosa Marie that he didn't have the drugs with him at the plaza, but he had some in his car. So he asked Rosa Marie if she would follow them to the vehicle to, you know, administer the drugs for them. Les seemed uncomfortable about doing the injections at Garima Place, so they drove her to Canberra Showground, which second location, never. No. Oh. Once there, Rosa Marie injected them with the amphetamines, and then she asked them to return back to Grima Place. But, of course, the two men ignored her and drove toward the town of Yass. Kiwi was the one driving the car, and Les climbed into the back seat with Rosa Marie. Les turned to the girl and said, quote, We're going to fuck you now. When Rosa Marie said that she didn't want to have sex with him, Les pulled out a 10-centimeter long folding knife, about four inches long, and held it to her neck. And then that's when Rosa Marie stopped arguing. For the next 12 hours, the two men held her captive and repeatedly raped her. Les punched her in the head over and over and threatened to tie her up if she did not comply with his demands. Les not only forced himself on the girl, but he would force her to perform oral sex on him. Mm. And he would tell her to do it properly. And I guess... Okay, here's what he said. Do it properly. Don't use your teeth. Oh. 
just to make Rosa Marie understand that he meant business, Les told her that they would drag her behind the car if she didn't cooperate. Mm. Kiwi continued to drive the car towards Sydney, and each time they would stop to get gas or get a drink or use the bathroom, they raped her. At one point, they approached Campbelltown, and the two men reminisced about how they were in this area where they, quote, finished off that stripper one time. Now, Rosa Marie knew she had to escape or she was going to die. And she was right. They were going to take her to a bridge and throw her off. She thought about jumping from the car while it was moving, but she couldn't open the doors because they couldn't be opened from the inside. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if they pulled some kind of Ted Bundy thing or if they put child locks on the back of the car. So it makes me always want to 97. Uh, There's probably child locks on them by then. Yeah, that's what I mean. But I, I just makes me always want to check for child locks when I get in a car of people I don't know now. Do you get in cars with a lot of strangers? (laughs) You never know. You never know. What about your Ubers? Taking an Uber. That's true. That's true. That's true. Just before dawn at the rest area near the town of Bowral, Rosa Marie told her captors that she needed to use the bathroom. And the girl was only in a t-shirt and shoes, so they just assumed that she probably wouldn't try to make a run for it. Besides, they were in the middle of nowhere, By this point, I mean, they were surrounded by woods and brambles. So the two men, not thinking clearly because of the drugs and severely overestimating Rosa Marie's concern for her state of undress, they let her go to the toilet alone. Rosa Marie saw this opportunity and she ran for the woods. Branches tore at her skin. They slapped in her face as she ran as fast as possible. She could hear the two men chasing after her. Rosa Marie saw a large wombat hole and dove for it. And she hid there until the two men ran past her. Once she was sure the two men were gone, Rosa Marie emerged from her hiding spot and ran to a local farmhouse where they called the police. Unbelievably, the two men, Les and Kiwi, showed up at the farmhouse just after the police did. Why? And of course... (laughs) What were they saying? I guess they were looking for her, right? Now, their version of events was that she agreed to have sex with them in return for drugs. No. Now, why the authorities, why they believed that the rape and captivity was consensual. They believed that? Mm Mm-hmm. When she was clearly running through the woods, half naked, to escape from the two men. We don't know. It's not understood. But Rosa Marie refused to press charges since she was afraid, and she felt pretty certain that nothing would ever come of it. Mm -hmm. Huh. Now, this is one of the dozens of missed opportunities that could have stopped the upcoming tragedy in Bega from unfolding. See how they got away with it for so long? I don't understand. I mean, just wouldn't you investigate that no matter what? I don't know. You would think. You would like, think. Like, also, two guys, what two guys are going to come to a house and say, hey, we're looking for this girl because, you know, she promised us sex. Right. It's just bizarre. Halfway between Sydney and Melbourne, along the southeast coast of Australia, is the town of Bega. Surrounded by lush rolling hills, green pastures, and, quote, the most relaxed cows in Australia. The town is home to the famous Bega Cheese Factory, along with many cafes, shops, and galleries. The lucky residents of this idyllic village are just 10 miles from the Sapphire Coast, with breathtaking views of the brilliant blue ocean and excellent opportunities for surfing. The residents of that region relish the outdoor life and enjoy the safety of their town, But one thing the residents of Bega have painfully learned is that there's no safe place from random acts of violence. Nothing can stop nefarious scumbags from riding joyfully through your peaceful, utopian-like neighborhood. It was there in Bega where school friends decided to do something special to celebrate Lauren Margaret Berry's upcoming birthday. Born to Garrett and Cheryl Berry on the 11th of October, 1982, Lauren was a quiet girl who was extremely close to her older brother, Nathan. Nathan described her as a very strong person with and his best friend. Lauren was in ninth grade and about to turn 15, and she was best friends with Nicole Collins, who was in 11th grade. With Bega only having a population of about 5,000 people, the community was a pretty close-knit group. While Lauren had long, dark hair and a huge smile, Nicole was the opposite. Nicole Emma Collins was born on the 14th of November, 1980, to Graham and Delma Collins. Nicole was petite, bubbly, and outgoing. She had golden blonde hair, blue eyes, and glasses. And the two girls could always be found riding or working with Nicole's horses. 
Lauren and Nicole planned a camping party at the local camping area just two miles from Nicole's home in Kalaroo. On Friday, October 3rd, 1997, Nicole's father set up a tent and campsite for the girls and their friends near the Tathra Biga Road overlooking the ocean. Because of the long Labor Day weekend, other parties were happening all over the Biga area, plus there was a music festival in town. All the kids in attendance had agreed to check in with parents on a regular basis, or they'd go home to shower, gather food, etc. And their parents also did periodic checks on the kids as well. And this is before the time of cell phones, and this was pretty much the only way for the parents to keep tabs on their children. So the kids were going to go out camping by themselves. Also camping with Laura and Nicole were fellow schoolmates Sarah, Rebecca, Malcolm, Damien. Uh, Lauren's brother Nathan was there and a friend from Sydney by the name of Todd. The first day, Friday, October 3rd, was spent horseback riding. They rode down Boulder Bay along the Kangaroothra Track, which was about two miles from their campsite. They also spent some time swimming. Then Lauren went home on Saturday, October 4th, to enjoy a birthday dinner and cake with her family, and everything was going smoothly, and everybody was having a great time. When Lauren returned to the camp, things were beginning to wind down for the evening, and Nicole, who had recently experienced a breakup with her boyfriend, was now having second thoughts about that decision. You know how you get a little, you know? One of the fellow campers, Rebecca, had said that since she and Sarah... Both had their boyfriends with them at the camp, and Lauren and Nicole were single, that she thought maybe possibly the two girls were feeling a little bit out of place. Maybe seeing Rebecca and Sarah with their boyfriends helped contribute to Nicole's melancholy contemplation. We don't know. Or Mm -hmm. they could just be teenagers, right? People continued to come and go at the campground at various times, and parents continued to drop in and see how things were going. On Sunday, the fun continued, but by Sunday evening, as everybody was sitting around the campfire, Nicole seemed to really want to sort things out with her ex-boyfriend. There was a party in nearby Jilla, which was about five miles away, that Nicole knew that this boy was going to be attending. Now, Lauren's brother, Nathan, he was the only one that had a car there, but he left it around 7 o'clock at the 7 p.m., you know, just to go out and do whatever. And the girls really hadn't decided if they were going to go to the party or not. At 10 o'clock at night, uh, that's when Nicole decided, yeah, she did want to go to Jilla five miles away. So Nicole put on her school jacket and Lauren was carrying a flashlight and they decided to walk to Jilla five miles away to walk. No. At night, 10 p.m. I'm just lazy. That never happened. No. The last thing Nicole said before leaving the campsite that before leaving the campsite was that she would go, quote, sort her life out. Mm-hmm. Lauren and Nicole's friends have said in interviews that it's not unusual for teens in that area to walk everywhere since, you know, very few of them had a license or a car. And the only one at the camp that had a car or a vehicle was Nathan, but he wasn't there when the girls decided to leave. And while it might seem out of the ordinary, while it might seem out of the ordinary to some for two ne- teenage girls to walk five miles in the dark in an open country like Australia, where to us America. It seems like all the wildlife is oh. hell-bent on killing mm-hmm. humans. Thank you. Yep. It's just how the girls had always lived and traveled, and nobody thought really anything of it. And it should have been safe. Should have been. Now, Nathan Barry arrived back at the camp at about 10 minutes after 10 p.m., 10 minutes after the girls left. So he, did, he, he didn't see him, so they went a different direction, I'm guessing? No, he didn't see the girl. There, I, I believe there's only one way in and one way out. It was a campsite. Yeah. Okay, that's right. just making a little note of that. Okay. Yeah. So Nathan arrived back at the camp 10 minutes after 10 p.m. And he didn't see the girls on the road. And he had asked where the girls were. And he was told that they'd gone to a party. Most people at the campsite thought the girls would get as far as Nicole's house, which was two miles away, and that they'd stay there for the night because Jilla was five miles away. And even at a good pace, good clip, probably would have taken the girls about an hour and a half just to get there. And it would be almost midnight by the time they would arrive. The next morning, when all the campers got up and saw that Lauren and Nicole had not returned to the camp, this thought was reinforced that they must have stayed the night at the party or stopped at one of their houses. Nathan searched for the girls, but they were not at his house, they were not at Nicole's house, and they'd never made it to the party the night before. With growing concern, the parents headed for the campground, and when they discovered the girls weren't there either, they called the police. Along with the police, Biga Volunteer Rescue Squad, Naruma Volunteer Rescue Association, or Rescue Squad, and the State Emergency Services from Burmagui 
all search for the girls, with a particular focus on Evans Hill between Kalaroo and Tarthra. Detectives who were stationed in other towns came to Bega to help work the case. They searched the coastlines, the bush, and all the places they thought the girls would frequent, but it was to no avail. One thing that was a little bit out of the ordinary uh, was that a witness driving on Evans Hill said that they had seen a pink television set discarded on the side of the road. But when they drove back by the same spot hours later, it was gone. I guess they made note of it because it's a pink television set. That's yeah, pink. and it's weird. I mean, they're out in the middle of nowhere, and I'll, they drive one way, and there's a pink television set on the side of the road, and then yeah. they drive back, and it's gone. Hmm. And so they were probably asked, anything out of the ordinary? Well, I did see this pink television. I mean, that's how it's playing in my head, yeah. anyway. I got you. Another witness came forward and said that around 9, 50, 10 o'clock in the p.m. evening, she was driving down Tathra Road when she saw a car pulled off onto the side. She saw two girls standing by the vehicle talking to a man. Incidentally, there was a house with the light on just about a half a football field away from where the car was pulled over. The only other clues that surfaced were two clothing items belonging to Lauren Barry. A grayish hoodie and a plaid shirt were found on Old Wallagoot Road. It's unknown if the clothing had been left there accidentally or if Lauren had somehow left it there on purpose to show what directions they were being taken. Either way, that clothing would end up being the only DNA evidence in this case. Ooh. Detective Winterflood headed up the investigation, and after three weeks and many man hours, the police decided to wind down the search. This was no longer a rescue mission. There happened to be a detective from Yass who had passed through the meeting room at the police station and, seeing the inquiry board about the investigation, told Detective Winterflood that two career criminals were living up in Yass. 23-year-old Lindsay Beckett, and 28-year-old Leslie Camilleri. Now, he thought, you know what, these guys may be capable of committing these crimes and that the police probably should take a look at them. Furthermore, another investigator from Yas said that he'd heard from another one of their informants that while the informant was in a room with Camilleri and Beckett, they saw a newspaper with the story of the missing girls lying on the table. Camilleri said, quote, I bet the police will try to pin that shit on us. Yes, is a three and a half hour drive from Bega. So the detectives found this statement to be really odd. Why would these men that far away ever think that the police would want to pin that on them? Unless they were involved. Uh, so the police decided, hey, I think we want to do an interview with these men. So that's what they did. Good. Just an interesting fact. The Australian Federation Police arrested Beckett on October 27th on car theft charges and remanded him into custody. Among the things found in this stolen car was a map of Bega. Lindsay Huani Beck was born in 1974 in New Zealand. His mother was 15 years old when she gave birth to him. No, he was a product of rape. His mother later married a man who drank heavily and abused her children. When the family car was stolen, the stepfather beat Lindsay with an electrical cord and kicked him until he fell unconscious because he needed somebody to take his anger out on. He huh. needed somebody to take his anger out on. He also stabbed Beckett in the hand once when he couldn't find the car keys. By 14 years of age, Beckett was a heavy smoker and would often turn to marijuana to block out the pain of his family life. He had a low IQ and was easily led astray. When he was 16, he left school and fled New Zealand for Australia to live with his mother's relatives. In 1992, Lindsay Beckett, known as Kiwi to his friends, started dating a younger girl named Laura Lee Tatt. When she became pregnant, Beckett moved in with her. And although they never married, the couple lived together in Griffith and soon produced three more children. The relationship was volatile with Beckett doling out beatings just like the ones he received as a child. By 1995, the couple moved to Yass, and that's where Beckett met Les Camilleri. In November of 1997, as the detectives drove to Yass to interview Beckett, they were thumbing through the file on the missing girls just to refresh their memory, and they came upon the part about the pink television. And one of the police officers mentioned to Detective Mark Winterflood that he thought, you know what, this could probably be significant. If a person had the television in the back of their car and they stopped to pick up two girls, there probably wouldn't be enough room for both girls and the television. So it would make sense to set the television out on the side of the road. Detector Winterflood thought that maybe he was right and filed that bit of information for the interview. 
Hmm. On November 5th, 1997, Beckett was formally questioned by the police about the disappearance of Lauren and Nicole. Detective Winterflood recalls how Beckett was totally relaxed during the interview and how he even had his foot up on the chair and he was swiveling it back and forth like he didn't have a care in the world. And by this time, the police had already established from one of their informants that Beckett and Camilleri had received a pink television as partial payment in a drug deal. Toward the end of the interview with Beckett, Detective Winterflood asked him about the pink television. Then you know what happened? Oh, Beckett's no. demeanor totally changed. Oh, yeah, now he's not so laid back, is he? Uh, mm-hmm. He paused He paused for a very long time and said, you know what? I can't remember what happened to that television. And he realized at that moment that the pink television put them on Evans Hill in Bega the night the, of the girl's disappearance. Yeah, I was just thinking, why would he even admit to that? Exactly. Like, that just mm-hmm. gave them away. Now police wanted to interview Leslie Camilleri, who was already in jail on a probation violation from an earlier arrest. Leslie Arthur Camilleri was born in 1969 in a suburb of Sydney, Australia. Had no less tragic upbringing than Beckett. One of six children, Camilleri did not meet his real father until he was almost 13. He didn't attend school or receive an education, and he couldn't read or write. By the time he was 12 years old, he was well on his way of a life of crime and brought before the juvenile courts. He had already spent two years living on the street, surviving however he could. His first appearance in the Mendez Children's Court was for breaking and entering, including stealing. Shortly thereafter, several more criminal offenses were added to his record, including theft, various motor vehicle offenses, weapon carrying, and drug possession. And he was remanded to juvenile detention until he was 15. In 1986, Camilleri decided to leave New South Wales illegally while on a good behavior bond and headed to Queensland to start fresh. He just wanted to leave his criminal record behind. However... In 1989, he was charged with various offenses, including 15 motor vehicle thefts, eight break and enters, and 92 counts of stealing. He was sentenced to just three years in prison for the acclamation of crimes. That's unreal. When Camilleri was released from prison, he met and moved in with a woman by the name of Helen and her nine year old daughter. After a few months, Camilleri decided to move back to New South Wales. He traveled to the small country town of Bine along near Yass, where Helen and her daughter followed, and soon the couple was back together. By March of 1994, Helen gave birth to Camilleri's daughter, Jade, and the family soon moved to a bigger house in the town of Yass. On the 4th of October, 1995, Camilleri was charged with 10 counts of sexual crime, including six counts for sexual intercourse with a child under the age of 16 and one of indecent assault, allegedly committed against the 11-year-old girl. By the beginning of 1997, Camilleri and Beckett began taking harder drugs, mostly various forms of speed. In April of 1997, Camilleri was again in front of the courts, charged with receiving and being in possession of stolen goods. At the time, Beckett was suspended for driving after being stopped by police with a high-range alcohol limit and charged for improper conduct and drugs found in his car. As 1997 continued, the two men appeared time and time again in court for a range of charges. One charge against Camilleri that was later dropped was by a young girl who claimed that he forced his way into her home and tried to rape her. With all the mounting charges, Camilleri found himself sentenced to periodic detention. He was to attend prison every weekend for four months. Every weekend. What? Just the weekend. His first days at Campbelltown Detention Center were September 5th and 6th of 1997, and he hated doing the weekend detention and appealed to the courts to switch to his days to the weekdays because he told them he wanted to play cricket on the weekends. Oh, well, isn't that nice? That's the whole thing screwed up. I'm sorry you have to go to jail for four months every week on the weekend. Yeah, I I don't get that. But here's the kicker. You know, I just want to do week. The weekdays, because I need to play my cricket on the weekend. The court agreed. No, they did not. No. But the funny thing, Camilleri rarely attended this detention at all, and nothing was ever done about it. What? That's not even that long ago. Like, this didn't take place that long ago. I know. I know. 
The sexual abuse case was heard on Monday, the 8th of September, 1997, where Judge Frederick Kirkham in the Queen Bean District Court. The child gave evidence that over a period of 12 months, Camilleri had molested and penetrated her several times. She actually kind of went into graphic detail about what happened. Not really going to read it because it's very bothersome. And she's 11. The trial was aborted due to a police minister who thought Camilleri would not get a fair trial due to some of the comments made earlier. And now Camilleri, who at this point had 146 criminal convictions, they just released him. I mean, this little girl said that she was raped and they released him. I don't understand that. I really don't. I don't either. And that's when he decided to make a trip to Canberra with Beckett. And that was just five days before the abduction and rape of Rosa Marie. So in November of 1997, when detectives wanted to question Camilleri, he was already in jail for a breach of bail. Camilleri said that he didn't know anything about the girls from Biga. And as with Beckett, his fear was palpable when asked about the pink television set. He completely went silent for an entire minute. And instead of answering the question, he shut down the interview and said he didn't want to speak to the police anymore. A prison psychologist said that after Camilleri returned to his cell, he began crying and beating his head against the bars, mumbling to himself, quote, they know about the television, is what he was saying. He was so distraught that he had to be sedated. The prison psychologist immediately called Detective Winterflood, explaining that she thought Camilleri's outburst was significant evidence, and she told him what happened. Detectives discovered that Beckett was basically Camilleri's lapdog. He would actually sleep in Camilleri's front porch so that he would be there in the morning when Camilleri woke up and gave him instructions for what to do with that day. Really? Mm-hmm. With his low IQ and mm-hmm. his lackey behavior, the police assumed correctly that between the two men, Beckett would be the one to crack first. So they put Beckett in an interview room with two 8x10 color photos of Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins on the table before him. Beckett immediately turned them over so that he wouldn't have to see their innocent, smiling faces looking up at him. Wow. During a short break from the interview, Beckett went out for a cigarette. And when he returned, he looked at Detective Winterflood and said, quote, give me a map and I'll show you where they are. Lindsay Beckett pointed out a spot on the map. Winterflood asked how they had been killed and who had killed them. And Beckett responded that he had been the one to kill both of them by cutting their throats. And while the words cut their throats are terrifying, they sound almost benign to about compared to what horrors the girls suffered. The story and imagery that Beckett told in his confession laid bare of Australia's most gruesome, cold-blooded crimes. And this is what Beckett said that happened. On October 5th, 1997, Beckett and Camilleri drove a banged-up old Ford Telstar they had stolen from Andrew Smarts a while earlier. Andrew was a man that owed them money, and they drove to Bega to visit a friend. Camilleri had taken the man's checkbook and pink television set. And the Telstar's back doors did not open from the inside. Mm. At about 10 a.m. on Sunday, October 5th, 1997, Beckett cashed a check made out to him for $44 and bought a bottle of Bundaberg rum, a package of VB Stubbies at the Monroe Pub in Kuma. Beckett and Camilleri took the alcohol back to their friend's house where they drank and did drugs. By 8 p.m. that evening, their friends kicked them out. The two men left the house in the Telstar and went driving around Bega. Neither Camilleri nor Beckett would do self-injections of drugs, so they would inject each other. What's the difference? I hate to say this. Sorry, but what pussies, right? (laughs) Seriously. If you're going to, I don't know. People are so weird. Between 8 and 10 p.m., the two men cruised the back roads, drinking and administering, drinking and administrating speed to each other. As they drove through the dark, they suddenly noticed two girls walking single file on the side of the Begath Tathra Road. They pulled the car over and asked the girls about the music festival in town. Then they asked if the girls wanted to go to a beach party. In his confession, Beckett swore that the girls got into the car willingly. Detectives working the case said that Beckett had been very forthcoming with them about all the gruesome aspects of the crime during the confession, so he wouldn't have had any reason to lie about that particular detail. Still, all that knew the girls personally said that it would be very out of character for them to have gotten into the car willingly. I'm going to say I've been that age and have gotten in cars willingly with people I didn't know. Well, I was just thinking, too, if you're going to the music festival, hey, so are we. Hop in. Yeah, 
Right. Or a beach party. Hell yeah, I'll go to a beach party. Yeah. But the kids yeah. do stupid things. Mm-hmm. But who, who's to say? I didn't know these girls, but I know that I would have. I would bet 10 bucks that I would have gotten in the car. Beckett opened the back door of the car for the girls to get in, but realized they had no room for in the car's trunk for the pink television set. He tossed it to the side of the road. And once the girls were in the car, their fate was sealed. The four of them drove to Tothra Beach and stayed a little while before the girls decided they needed to return to their camp. Camilleri said that he would gladly drive the girls back to the site and headed along the dirt road back to White Rock. Beckett said that the car had kept bottoming out and the underneath was damaged by some rocks, which enraged Camilleri. And he began yelling at Lauren and Nicole. Just because it's their took fault. it out on them. It is, I guess. And that's when the two men revealed that they had knives. Lauren and Nicole were frozen in fear. I can only, my heart drops for this. Camilleri reversed the car and drove towards Kalaroo. He continued driving along Old Wallagoot Road and towards the Sapphire Coast Highway. The men spotted a small clearing and Camilleri parked the car. Beckett pulled Lauren out of the car and ordered her to remove her clothes and underwear. Lauren, being scared, complied. She then explained to Beckett that she was on her period and that she was a virgin. If she thought those facts would stop him, they didn't. Beckett then raped Lauren and Camilleri raped Nicole. Camilleri and Beckett forced both girls back into the backseat of the vehicle and continued their drive. The car headed along Old Wallagoot Road towards Eden. Just before the entrance to Eden, Camilleri turned the car to Ben Boyd National Park and Camilleri decided that he would rape Lauren. So while Camilleri was in the bush with Lauren, Beckett raped Nicole and Beckett admitted that the two girls were too scared to even attempt to fight. In addition to the threats that were made and the weapons they had, the girls never encountered this type of evil before. They had no experience in their short lives with which to arm themselves against this type of situation. After the sexual assaults were finished, the four of them got back in the car and Camilleri drove into Eden. They continued to U-Turn Bay, where once the car was stopped, more sexual assaults ensued. The girls were forced into the car's backseat once more as the men continued to travel south, leaving New South Wales and entering the state of Victoria. And by this point, Camilleri had fallen asleep, and they were headed towards Orbust when he woke up. Camilleri told Beckett he needed to find another spot so they could rape the girls again. So Beckett spotted a property with an open green gate, and they pulled the car inside. Camilleri told Beckett to stop the car at a clearing and got out and forced Lauren to get out of the car as well. Beckett then proceeded to rape Nicole while Camilleri was in the woods with Lauren. And when Camilleri emerged from the woods, he was no longer wearing his shirt and he had given it to Lauren to wear. Really? By the time the time the sun came up, the girls had been held captive, raped, and beaten for nine hours. It was at this point that Camilleri made the comment that they, quote, couldn't go back. Beckett knew that that meant the girls had to be killed. The girls could not be allowed to identify their kidnappers. Beckett turned off the highway at a secluded spot, and Lauren, who was almost catatonic from fear, asked the men if they would kill them. And Camilleri assured her that they just wanted to tie them up so he and Beckett could get a head start and go into hiding. And that was just one of the many lies that Camilleri told in his lifetime, but it was probably the most cruel. By 8 a.m., Beckett stopped the car near Fiddler's Green Creek in Victoria. And with their hands tied securely, Lauren and Nicole were dragged by their captors through the brush to the creek. Camilleri told Beckett to untie Nicole and then demanded that she get into the water to wash up. To get DNA off, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Nicole was tired and beaten and could barely move by this point, but Camilleri wielded his knife and told her to, quote, get the fuck in there and wash out her vagina. She complained about the water being cold, but the men didn't care. Then Lauren washed herself in the water as well. Once Lauren was finished, both girls were tied and told to lie down on their stomachs. And Camilleri had brought a rope with him from the car and Nicole was tied to a tree while Lauren was led to an area near the water and hogtied so that she couldn't move. And it was at that point that Camilleri instructed Beckett to kill the girls. So he's too much of a chicken to do it himself? Yep. Beckett thought it was unfair that he had killed both of them, 
and that Camilleri should at least kill one of them. And in his statement, Beckett said that Camilleri threatened to kill him, so he had to murder both girls. The following quote is from his confession. Quote, I held Lauren's head underwater, and she was struggling, and she knocked me into the water. One of my knees went into the water. This pissed me off a little bit, and I opened the knife, and I stabbed Lauren on the left side of the neck while her head was still in the water. After a couple seconds, after I stabbed her, she stopped moving. After I stabbed Lauren, I ran up to the bank where I tied Nicole up. I walked around to her left side, and I cut her throat two or three times. After this, she just started thrashing around on the ground. She was trying to scream, but nothing was coming out. I kicked her and put my foot on her to keep her still. This didn't work, so I stabbed her in the throat. I aimed and stabbed at the hard thing, which is her wind type, in her neck. I pushed the knife all the way in, but she still wouldn't keep still. So I worked out where her heart would be, and I stabbed her on the left side of the chest. She still didn't stop moving, so I stabbed her in the front of the chest. I was aiming for her heart. I needed two hands to get to the knife to get through her chest plate. or to her. He said chest, but it's her chest plate. She kept moving, so I kicked her in the head a couple of times, and she still kept moving, but she was slowing down. I waited until she stopped moving, which didn't take long. Beckett removed the ropes and returned to the car where Camilleri was waiting. When Beckett got into the vehicle, Camilleri said to him, quote, Did you see the demon? Did you feel the demon? Which, to be quite honest, I have no idea what that means. Does that mean him unleashing his fury on them? Demon? Is it drug-fueled? I don't know. It's To me, it was unclear. I couldn't figure out if they even explained it anywhere. I would think it meant that, like, when he did that, the demon took over. Did you see it? I don't know. Yeah. But it's something else. Over the next few days, Beckett said that they burned the clothes they wore and the clothes that were taken from the girls. They threw their knives into Lake Burley Griffin, um, one of which was later recovered. They scrubbed the car to remove any of it, and they scrubbed the car to remove any evidence. They also drove back to Evans Hill to pick up the pink television, but it was gone. Good. Both men then returned to Yass and their girlfriends before traveling on to Sydney. They stayed with Camilleri's half-brother, Michael James Tierney, who would later be charged with accessory after the fact. On Wednesday, November 12, 1997, at 10 p.m., six weeks after they went missing, the decomposing bodies of the teenagers Lauren Barry and Nicole Collins were found about 600 meters from the Monroe Highway along the bush track among the gray gums and the stringy bark trees. Upon telling the parents that their daughter's bodies had been found, the police officers wept with them. It's, there's videos of that, and it's heart-wrenching. I mean, the one detective, just tears were pouring out of his eyes. So it's not normal. That's not how, supposed, how life is supposed to go. No. On November 15th, Beckett was extradited to Victoria to face formal charges re- regarding the girls' murders. And with Beckett's confession, Camilleri was also extradited to Victoria to face formal charges of murder. Camilleri claimed that he was in a heroin-induced stupor through the entire nine-hour horror ride and that everything was Beckett's idea and that Beckett did everything. That defense might have worked except for one thing. That piece of clothing belonging to Laura that was found on Old Wallagoot Road was processed by the lab and found to have Leslie's Camilleri's semen on it. Mm -hmm. Beckett's the the lap dog, right? Beckett's the lap dog. He just thought he could blame them. Yep. Mm Mm-hmm. Wrong. Now, and this is where Rosa Marie comes back to the story. Even though no arrests were made in her abduction and sexual assault, Rosa Marie got her day in court. She identified her attackers as Leslie Camilleri and Lindsay Beckett and testified to her ordeal. Camilleri pretended to be all wide and innocent and looked more and more, but he looked more and more guilty. Rosa Marie had said that Camilleri threatened to beat her if her teeth touched him at all during fellatio. And these were the exact words that Beckett said Camilleri had spoken to Lauren and Nicole, and the exact same words that the 11-year-old alleged sexual assault victim reported that Camilleri said to her as well. 
From a legal standpoint, Rosemary's testimony established Beckett and Camilleri's way of operating. It also demonstrated their propensity for violence. On August 20th, 1998, Beckett pleaded guilty, and Justice Vincent stated, quote, Lindsay Beckett, you have pleaded guilty to the murder at Fiddler's Green Creek in the state of Victoria on or about the 6th of October, 1997, of two young persons named Lauren Margaret Berry and Nicole Emma Collins. You represent the dark in which our women and children fearfully walk. That gives me goosebumps. It really does. Judge Vincent sentenced Beckett to two life sentences with a minimum serving time of 35 years, and he will be eligible for parole in 2033. Really thinking that's probably not going to happen. I hope not. In an article written by Carolyn Overington, Lauren Collins' father, Graham, who had attended the trial along with Nicole's parents, was quoted as saying, quote, It was condensed into one page of testimony from Beckett, the last hour of her life. This might sound strange, but I was born and raised on a farm. I know how animals die. I thought I would be prepared, but, well, he slaughtered Nicole. I found that very difficult to hear, but I thought, however awful this is to me, it is nothing Nothing like what she suffered. So it is irrelevant how I felt. I needed to do that for her. In the same article, Nicole's father, Garrett Berry, who recalled being there at the court, quote, in the courtroom, I had to use all my control not to lunge at him. I would have liked to have killed him, I supposed, tear him to pieces and physically. I think I could do that. But again, what's the point? And I don't want to be at this level. And I don't think in the end it would make me feel any better. I see the need to have him in prison to protect the community. Other than that, there's no way to punish him. How the families remained calm inside the courtroom is beyond me, and especially when Beckett said Lauren had been cuddling him. Yeah, he he said Lauren was cuddling up to him in the car, and she really seemed to enjoy being raped. Mm. At that Mm -hmm. age, uh uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. I mean, she's probably trying to 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 make him him be a, a little bit of human. She was hoping to show her to show him that she was human to show. Yeah. Right. To show him that she was a real person. So maybe possibly he wouldn't kill her. Well, it seemed like, too, he kind of he thought that his partner in crime should it was only fair. You know what I'm saying? So Mm -hmm. maybe he did for a tinge kind of think maybe we shouldn't do this. Right. When it came time for Camilleri's trial, the judge saw through his lame duck defense and pleading not guilty and purposefully pretending to yawn during the trial and testimonies, he took no responsibility and showed no remorse for anything. Mm -hmm. The judge said, quote, using the control which you clearly had over your weaker willed but equally evil companion, meaning Beckett, you instructed him to perform acts that, in a somewhat perverse way, it could be said that you probably did not possess the courage to perform yourself. Through your own actions, you have forfeited your right to ever walk among us again. Camilleri was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But it doesn't end there. What? In 2013, out of the blue, Leslie Camilleri confessed to abducting and killing Prue Bird, Mm -hmm. who went missing in 1992. Mm -hmm. By this time, the police had developed a working theory that Prue Bird was the innocent victim of a revenge killing. In March of 1986, a crime gang blew up the Russell Street police station in an act of domestic terrorism. Their goal had been to kill as many as police as they could possibly kill. In that bombing, one policewoman died and almost two dozen people were injured. A member of that game, Paul Hetzel, became a crowny, as they say, which means he became a crown witness to the trial. Paul Hetzel, the police informant who turned against the gang members, was Prue Bird's grandfather. One of those gang members, Craig Minogue, had said to Hetzel, quote, if any bastard ever thought about going to the cops about us, they'll be killed, and so will their effing families. It would be a shame if anything happened to your little sweet Prue, wouldn't it? Oh, wow. For years, the pl- yeah, for years, the police had concluded that whatever had happened to Prue, the gang members were responsible. So when Camilleri confessed to her murder, the police were confused since Camilleri was not known to be a member of that gang. 
They showed Camilleri's picture to witness M, who, years later, picked him out of a lineup as the man in the blue car that had followed her that day she left Prue's house. In his confession, Camilleri said that he had dumped Prue's body in Frankston, but he, like, never, he said he couldn't remember exactly where. Mm -hmm. So her body's, yeah. So for this, he was sentenced to an additional 28 years for the murder of Prue Bird. However, police still don't know if the killing of Prue was an assassination that Camilleri performed for money or as a favor to the gang. There's even a possibility that Camilleri didn't kill Prue at all, but took the fall for somebody else. Camilleri's sentence for the Bega murders is a life sentence with no parole, and he would never get out of jail no matter what. So it is possible that he killed Prue either as a favor or a debt he owed the gang, but it's also possible that he accepted the blame, right? I mean, he's not going anywhere. Since his confession was light on facts and specifics, the police think that things, quote, just don't add up. Prue's body has never been found and likely will never know the specifics surrounding her death. Nothing has come to light on the stripper that Camilleri and Beckett discussed doing away with either. Oh. So in this case, the reasons to report the gruesome facts is we're not here to sensationalize it or to give listeners some kind of perverted thrill. It is to drive home the point that when the justice system fails, it has long-reaching tentacles. With over 200 convictions between them, Beckett and Camilleri, this should have never Never. No. No. Um, it never happened. They should not even be They out. should never have been on the streets at all, right? Earlier in 1997, in June, Camilleri had been charged with theft and breaking and entering. Plus, he was already out on bail awaiting the sexual abuse trial. That is a clear breach of his bail conditions, but nothing was done about it, right? Mm -mm. In August, Camilleri was arrested for stealing a motorcycle, clearly breaking the conditions of his bail once again. And once again, he was let loose. Neither of these men have been held accountable for most of the crimes they committed before the Bega murders. They arrogantly pushed the system to the absolute li limits, always expecting mercy that they never once gave to their victims. The rape and murder of Lauren and Nicole is a tragedy that should never have happened. It's almost impossible to imagine what the girls experienced and how they felt. But sadly, they're not the only victims. Mm -mm. Sarah, one of the best friends who was at the camping that weekend, is so ravaged emotionally by what happened that she barely attended school for the entire year. Another friend, Rebecca, racked with such guilt over not talking the girls out of going to the party, still sobs uncontrollably all these years later when she talks about it. Minister Ron Anderson, who was with the parents when they heard all the gory details of what happened to their daughters and what they had endured has since questioned his faith and has screamed at God. Yeah, I can see that. Graham Collins, the father of Nicole, felt no satisfaction when Beckett and Camilleri were sentenced to prison. In fact, the whole ordeal left him with a profound sense of sadness. He's quoted as saying, I thought, how pointless is this? You've taken our girls. You've ruined your own life. You brought dishonor to your family, and you'll spend the rest of your life in jail. And what exactly was the point? It just struck me as futile. Because he was sick. That's why. Mm -hmm. Yep. He didn't. So they, they didn't care about anybody else or anything for that matter. Right. Officer Shane Box, who wept alongside the family when he told them their daughters had been found. He was also the one that kept the families from seeing the bodies in the woods. The animals, of course, and the heat had taken their toll. Officer Box said refusing to let the family see the girls in that state was one of the only things he could do to protect them. He also said that he desperately wanted to kill Beckett right there on the spot. And it was a miracle that he had let him out of the woods alive. See, that's what I was thinking, you know, who would be none the it, wiser, right? Exactly. Well, I'm sure they had other people with them. It just well, wasn't know, him and but Beckett. It, it would have to be kind of... You a, can keep their lips shut. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A little secret between the brotherhoods of the police officers. The guilt that Lauren's brother Nathan has had to live with is nearly crippling. He keeps going over it in his head, thinking that he should have been there to drive him to the party. He shouldn't have left the campsite. I mean, if he'd arrived back to the campsite just 10 minutes sooner, he would have seen them walking and had given them a ride. I mean, he just lives in his brain. It's it, the interview with him is I'm not joking. It's heart wrenching. The spot in his life that used to be occupied by a sister for years is nothing but a huge, unrelenting, unmanageable swell of grief. But it's not just her absence that's broken him. 
it's knowing what she went through is what nearly killed him. He waited until he was in his 30s before he had his own children because he wanted to make sure that he could love again. And that's it. That's the most awfulest tale I think we've come across. I think it's pretty darn bad. It's and not just, even a tale. It freaking happened. Well, not long ago. I mean, we've covered awful, awful things, but the fact that these guys were out to do this again and again and again, that's that's the crazy part. It, and they're not remorseful. There's no remorse. Mm-mm. When Beckett was recalling things, I mean, it, it seemed that he was very cold and matter of fact and senseless and... The girls are darling, not that that matters, but... But they're babies. They're little no. babies. You know? And you see a picture of Lauren next to her brother, Nathan. They're exactly the like. So I'm like, I'm looking at him thinking, that's what Lauren would look like now. Yep. You know? I mean, yep. it's it's really heartbreaking and it's really and you know what they- hard to digest. And I do want to say this was a, a listener request, but it was requested a while back and back before I was keeping track of who really requested things and mm-hmm. I apologize. So if you did request this, let me know and we'll add it to the um show notes. We'll add your name. But yeah, it's heartbreaking. The other thing I always wonder about these diabolical pairs that murder, you know, is would any of this happen had they not run across to each other? Do you know what I'm saying? Cuz the, you know, Beckett was a lap dog, the other guy was the mouth. I don't know. I just wonder, like, if they did not run into each other and become acquaintances or friends or whatever, had this never happened? Because I doubt I, it, Beckett well, would have done this. I doubt Beckett would have, too. I mean, I don't. Camilleri had the history of raping mm-hmm. young girls. So at he might One that we know of. So he might have continued. He probably wouldn't have killed anybody. Yeah. I'm not for sure about that. Yeah. But the, yeah, I mean, the, he was mostly breaking and entering and vehicle theft and that i mean he and the only person he really raped i think is his stepdaughter i think that's well him. i bet there was more but that we know of i mean that but we yeah. know of yeah well but that yeah, was a long convoluted story with lots of I know. things in it good job on the names and i do apologize for the graphic but we just we did really want to drive home mm-hmm. it the changes fact things that it when you could get- have it could have totally been stopped completely. I mean, if he would have been in jail like he should have, those girls would be fine today. Mm-hmm. And we would never here in America have heard about them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Jen, that was a good job. Um, uh, thanks to Loretta. She's the one that did all the research and all the writing on this. Oof. And it was very rough on her. She had a hard time. Normally, she can go through and do Just an episode yeah. very, very quickly. And this, it took a lot. She needed a lot of breaks. and. I know I just read through her sources. I didn't research as deep as she did. I did watch the TV shows. I did read articles. But to actually dig deep like she did, I don't know how she did it, to be yeah. honest. There's just it's some, horrible. Mm-hmm, some of those cases just vicious. leave, it is a, vicious. leave a thing on you. It's yeah. awful. Well, that was a good job, Jen. And so I guess until next time, we won't, don't want to keep the fine folks at home so they can go do something else besides listen to us, although we'd love them to listen to us 24-7. But we won't. So until then, remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, Bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Fertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from Octoberpod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at Our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at Our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at Our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash Our True Crime Podcast. 
You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love you.